The Australian Strategic Policy Institute is presenting this latest policy brief titled State-Sponsored Economic Cyber Espionage for Commercial Purposes, Tackling an Invisible but Persistent Threat to Prosperity. In this report, we looked at emerging rules and norms covering state-sponsored acts of cyber-enabled theft of intellectual property and assess current state practice. And finally, we offer a series of policy options for governments to consider. From our research and engagement with officials and industries over the past year, we reached the following conclusions. First, the agreement by the D20 leaders in 2015 to not conduct or support cyber-enabled theft of IP for commercial purposes has emerged as an accepted norm of responsible state behavior in cyberspace. Secondly, after we reported dip between 2015 and 2017 in reported cases, efforts to steal IP from universities and private firms have researched as a significant component of state's cyber espionage operations. And finally, there is a clear need for greater exchange of information between cybersecurity and counterintelligence agencies and industries at risk. So what is intellectual property? And what's the issue with cyber-enabled theft of intellectual property? Modern economies increasingly rely on a nation's ability to absorb new digital technologies and be innovative. Both advanced and emerging economies are increasingly turning into knowledge and technology-driven economies that are driven and enabled by intellectual property. At its core, intellectual property are items that are a property of the mind or proprietary knowledge. And IP refers to things like patents and trademarks, registered industrial designs, as well as sensitive business information and trade secrets. In other words, anything that is of intellectual and economic value to a company, a university, or even a country. While the practice of IP theft can be traced back to antiquity, the growing ubiquity of digital technology has made the practice more widespread as governments industrialized their economic espionage efforts through cyber means. In 2015, the leaders of the G20, which is the premier forum for international economic cooperation, recognized the risk that state-sponsored economic cyber espionage poses to the long-term economic growth of nations for the first time. They agreed that no country should conduct or support ICT-enabled theft of intellectual property which includes trade secrets or confidential business information, with the intent of providing competitive advantages to companies or commercial sectors. The purpose of this 2015 agreement was to constrain states in their use of cyber capabilities and put an end to their theft of commercially viable data with the aim of benefiting local companies. The bilateral agreement between the US and the People's Republic of China was subsequently endorsed by the G20 and supplemented with bilateral agreements between China and the UK, China and Germany, China and Australia, and China and Canada. The agreement overall has had mixed effects on the practice of economic cyber espionage. On the positives, the G20 agreement helped to elevate the issue to the agenda of political leaders and brought the threat of IP theft into greater public policy discourse. The U.S. had first identified economic cyber espionage as a threat in 2011, but it was also followed by Australia, the U.K., Canada, the Netherlands, and several other countries in recognizing economic cyber espionage as a distinct cyber security threat. Further enhancing the norm, some of these countries also worked together to publicly attribute states accused of non-compliance. In 2018, the British government held China's Ministry of State Security as responsible for malicious cyber campaign targeting IP and sensitive commercial data in Europe, Asia, and the US. And in 2021, the American government, in conjunction with seven other countries and two international organizations, also held the Chinese government responsible for conducting economic cyber espionage operations overseas. At the same time, the agreement itself seemed to have had little impact on reducing the frequency of the practice. The number of known cyber intrusions affecting commercial firms and universities around the world has largely increased since 2015. While we only saw around 40 state-sponsored cyber espionage operations between 2014 and 2016, hundreds of cases have occurred since then. And although not all these cases are likely cases of economic cyber espionage, the number of campaigns that specifically target private sector entities have made up a noticeable share of all known acts of cyber espionage. 
operation since uh, from 2017 onwards. While most of the cases occur in advanced economies, we are also seeing increasing number of cases affecting and targeting private entities in Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, and the Middle East. As a lot of firms and research institutes in other parts of the world become larger, wealthier, more innovative, and more integrated into global supply chains, they also become targets of IP theft. Several factors may explain why the norm has struggled to maintain momentum. First, there may be challenges in operationalizing the norm due to different interpretations of what the norm actually means. Um, as a reminder, the norm committed countries to refrain from conducting or supporting ICT-enabled theft of IP with the intent of providing competitive advantages to commercial firms. But states may disagree over whether trade secrets and sensitive business information should be accorded stronger attention over other IP rights. They may also disagree over what constitutes as stealing IP for commercial gain. So for example, one country may justify stealing IP from a defense manufacturer on national security grounds, even if they may have given the IP to one of their own uh, firms. So while it's common for states to interpret norms differently, when discrepancies are too large, they do undermine efforts to ensure compliance. Second, the increase in the number of cyber espionage operations can be attributed to major power competition, which is increasingly spilling into the economic and technological domains, meaning that states are increasingly incentivized to use all levers of power to attain uh, their strategic, commercial, and diplomatic goals. This is particularly more concerning as more countries are adopting assertive industrial development strategies and are less reluctant to use offensive cyber capabilities to pursue their aims. Third, although the norm has been largely agreed upon by all G20 members, the threat of economic cyber espionage has primarily been recognized as a distinct cybersecurity threat in advanced economies. Despite the growing problem in emerging economies, including those in the G20 like Brazil, India, and Indonesia, there seems to be little or no recognition of the cybersecurity threat elsewhere. As a result, the norm has not received the enthusiastic support of all nations just yet, even as we do see economic cyber espionage as something beyond an advanced economy problem. So what can governments do about all of this? First of all, defending against cyber-enabled theft of intellectual property only works in a preventive manner. Therefore, national efforts to strengthen cybersecurity resilience are an important avenue to address the risk of falling victim to economic cyber espionage. And governments have a duty and responsibility to help protect companies in defending against state actors or their proxies, given the skills, resources, and endurance they have. While there is an international component to defense, the onus of resilience lies at the domestic level. And a foundational step for governments in raising their awareness of the issue of state-sponsored economic cyber espionage is to improve visibility. National Computer Emergency Response Teams, or National Cybersecurity Centers, in combination with non-commercial and private cybersecurity service providers, play an important role in flagging those risks. Many of them have started actually a practice of publishing regular threat reports. The economic sectors most vulnerable to state-sponsored economic cyber espionage are likely to include the softer ones, such as startups, academia, and other research develop development and innovation hubs. They may, may maintain less hardened security parameters, since they're not considered entities, entities of national security or critical infrastructure, and often entertain international cooperation with peers operating in jurisdictions of less like-minded states. Knowing which companies, industries and sectors are the most IP intensive and critical assets of future economic growth is a first step before being able to assess their exposure to foreign intelligence agencies and to monitor specific cybersecurity threats to them. Such an effort would require government agencies responsible for economic policy and digital transformation, as well as the national IP authorities, to work together with their counterparts in the national security domain. Finally, members of the G20 and the broader UN membership should continue to raise and address the threat of economic cyber espionage in relevant forums. Even in situations where there is no acceptance of state responsibility for acts of cyber espionage, the authorities have a responsibility to, quote, not knowingly allow their territory to be misused, end of quote, and to, quote, not support ICT-enabled theft of intellectual property, end of quote. Those are agreed norms of responsible state behavior in cyberspace. And furthermore, 
those duties align with existing obligations under the TRIPS agreement to provide minimum standards of IP protection. Thanks for watching and the report is now available on the ASPE website.